Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, you know what it's like. You ask two old friends for some advice on a really thorny issue and they both tell you to do the exact opposite. Well, that's kind of what's happened to Theresa May today. Two Conservative big beasts, Chris Patton and Jacob Rees-Mogg, have been giving the Prime Minister very different advice on Brexit. We'll speak to them both in a moment, but first, let's take a look at those speeches, starting with Lord Patton's attack on the prospect of the UK signing trade deals after Brexit. One problem is that the ministers who talk about these fictitious trade deals have never actually negotiated one. The closest they've come to a trade deal is the checkout at Waitrose. <laughs> there's, a, there's a simple answer to the Northern Ireland border question and to much else besides, and it's provided by, as ever, by Sherlock Holmes. When you have eliminated, he said, what is impossible you're probably left with the solution. And the solution is the one that Anna Subri mentioned earlier. Let's stay in the customs union. Some of the great panjandrums of our time have told us that we are all very stupid and that we did not know what we were doing, that we did not realize that we were voting to leave the customs union and the single market, and that it was all done by uneducated people who ought to have listened to their betters. In truth, the vote was by people who believed in democracy. They recognised that the system that they were used to, where sending a Member of Parliament to Westminster who would determine their laws and seek redress of grievance, was under threat because once it was EU law, it was impossible. They voted to take back control. Well, that was Jacob Rees-Mogg, but Lord Patton joins me here in the studio. Welcome to The Daily Politics. Nice to meet you, Jane. You said today, at the beginning, in fact, of that clip that we showed, that the closest that government ministers have come to a free trade deal is the checkout at Waitrose. Yeah. What were you getting at exactly with that supermarket analogy? Well, w what I was suggesting is that there have been all sorts of reasons adduced for not staying in the customs union, the biggest of which is that we can't then do trade deals on our own. What are these trade deals that we're going to do on our own? The first ones would have to be trying to, as they say, grandfather, trying to do a cut-and-paste job on the existing trade deals which the European Union has done. And that isn't a straightforward business. If you look at the trade deal, one of the best that's been done with South Korea, and we're not going to get, because of rules of origin, the same sort of deal as Europe got for our car industry. And if you look at uh, services, there are all sorts of trade deals that, that we've done, that Europe's done, which include services, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia and others. You won't get those um, uh, if we're doing it on our own. Uh, Liam Fox, I'm sure he was a good GP, but L L Liam Fox doesn't really know anything about, about trade. And he has, argued, um, he has argued that in a year's time, within a minute, I think he said, of uh, leaving the European Union, we'd have 40 trade deals to sign off. It's nonsense. Well, there are countries that have said they are willing, of course, to sign trade deals. We've heard it from the likes of Australia, for example, you know, and New Zealand. Proportion and proportion of, of, of our exports go to Australia? Yes, a much smaller proportion Very than small. our uh, exports, obviously, to the EU. To but, Ireland. but what's to say it's a zero-sum game? I mean, David Davis was speaking at the weekend, uh, the Brexit secretary, and he said getting a really good trade deal with the EU is now overwhelmingly likely. At the very least, you would accept that we would get a Canada-style deal with goods, and they are hoping for something much better. Do you agree with that? Do you, do you want to know about the Canada deal? The, no. the, 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 <laughs> I'm sure you don't. I mean, th these are rather boring um, subjects to talk about, but they're extremely important. Canada, most of Canada's exports to the European Union are commodities which are free of tariffs, things like gold uh, and oil. Uh, uh, we do 11 times as much service exports but to the European Union But why wouldn't we get a good deal with the EU? because it wouldn't be as good as we've got now. It might not it be, be as good, good and it Theresa May has said that, but it would still be good. Well, it, if what you're saying is Theresa May says, well, we'll be outside the European Union, but it won't be as good for us when we are, I think that's true. But it could and be made I, up I'd with be... those free trade deals that will be signed afterwards and the combination of the two uh, uh, will be look, worthwhile. Look, we do uh, more trade with Ireland than we do with Korea, Japan, India and Australia combined. Uh, we're not going to make up in new trade deals um, what we lose um, from departing from the European Union. And don't forget that for years it was Britain that was opposing 
bilateral trade deals with countries like China and others on the grounds, I thought it was right at the time, that bilateral trade deals are merely ways of diverting trade. And what we had to find were multilateral deals, All which right. actually reduced tariffs and increased well, access across the board. If you were That's advising... It, 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 but, but important. Um, I mean, if you were advising um, the Brexit Secretary now or Theresa May, would you be saying we do need to stay in the customs union and the single market? I'd be saying... First of all, that we need to stay in the customs union and preferably the single market as well, because you cannot deal with the Irish border issue unless you do. And Theresa May said that herself before the last election, two days before the election. In the last election, she said, um, uh, "If we're outside the, uh, the the regulatory environment of the European Union, if we're outside the the, move, the free truth, free movement of people, part of the European Union, then there has to be a border. And if there's a border, you straight away undercut sure. our relationship." Uh, and that is and Proving to be agreement. difficult. I think everybody would. To be very I think everybody would agree with that. But at the moment, is it still impossible to find a solution that will overcome that issue of having an invisible border, retaining that, having a customs partnership, which the prime minister talked about, where Britain mirrors EU tariffs, and then technical solutions on top, where people could pre-register when they're travelling across. Name you one laugh. country that does. You it. laugh. Name um, a country that does it. Well, there are countries. I mean, Go Norway on. and Sweden would have some pre-registering. Oh, so about that. They they do have infrastructure, I agree. They have, they, have, they have border posts and they have customs officers. And something else they have is that customs officials for both sides are able to travel into the other country to a 15-kilometre to a line, sure. I think. But so what if about if the political that, will is there? You can imagine people being really, really keen, if they're from Northern Ireland or the Republic, of driving to, to, uh, to uh, make sure to, to invigilate uh, customs rules into the other territory. But isn't it's this about... It's inconceivable. But isn't it about political will? Chris Patton, if everybody agrees they don't want a hard border, they don't want that infrastructure, and there are technical ways of getting round some of the issues... Um, there aren't. Tell but me should they, they be, are. Well, the, well, it's not for you me, know, of course, to represent know. the I government, mean, but, but, but there are technical solutions that exist at certain ports where you can pre-register. Uh, you can have regular suppliers pre-registering. Um, it would be something that could be arranged for smaller businesses. Is it possible? No, I don't think it is. And I tell you who doesn't... I, I know nobody who knows about these things who thinks it is. The former Secretary-General of the WTO, Pascal Lamy, was also European Trade Commissioner. Now, he's suspect because he's French and he knows what he's talking about, <laughs> so you can't believe him. He says there is no example anywhere in the world of a virtual border when there are different customs regimes. How do you deal, deal with All the right. issue of, of different duties? How do you make negotiations with other countries on free trade agreement if you, have, if you don't have a border yourself? Right. Your speech was introduced by the Conservative MP Anna Soubry. Do you agree with what she said last month that Theresa May is in hock to 35 hard ideological Brexiteers and that she should stand up to them and possibly sling them out the party? Well, I don't um, necessarily find that I have to agree with everything, everybody I agree with on the big issues. Sure. Um, and, uh, but what about she those can, things? She, she can speak for herself. I think it's certainly true that the real management issues for Ms. management issue for Mrs May so far has been managing the right wing of the Conservative, part, have been managing people like Jacob, who I've known for years since he, since he was eight. The trouble is, his views when he was eight, when he was a charming, eccentric um, kid, uh, much the same as they are when he was 48. Uh, and I think, I think that a, here's an intelligent guy who's been taken over by the personality which the, which the press have assigned to him. So uh, I do think that managing people like, like Jacob, um, nice fellow that he is, um, has actually taken precedence with the leadership of the Conservative Party over doing the best deal for Britain. Right. Um, what do you say, listening to Chris Patton, um, particularly about the trade deals yeah. and about the border yeah. with Absolutely. Ireland? Absolutely. So uh, the first thing I'd say is the purpose of having a mayor for the West Midlands is to fight for our interests in this whole debate. And Chris mentioned the car industry, so let's be really clear. The single biggest priority for West Midlands business, given the nature of our economy, the export success of the UK, the the only area with a trade surplus with China, the only area to have grown its exports rapidly over the last five years, is that we negotiate the trade deal with the EU over the next uh, seven, eight months. I expect that to happen, and indeed I'll be down to see David Davis this afternoon to talk about exactly that and why it's so important all cars manufactured in the West Midlands <coughs> move through different EU countries in the supply chain. So we have to have that. That's the number one priority. Just before I let you go, will it be stop Brexit? 
I don't know. What's it, what I think is imperative is that Parliament should have the last word. And if you believe in taking back control, then you should think that it's decided in, in Parliament. And I'm, right. sure that, I'm sure that you'll get from Jacob an absolute commitment that there should be a free vote in the House of Commons. Well, let's see because we're about to talk to him. Chris Batten, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for coming in. Yes, we can now speak to Jacob Rees-Mogg, as promised, who's in central London and has just finished giving his speech. Uh, welcome to the programme, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Um, what were you getting at with your analogy you uh, about Japanese soldiers in World War II? Well, you just needed to listen to uh, Lord Patton, who is an immensely uh, distinguished figure. And what he was saying was basically that the result of the referendum should be overturned and that we should remain in the single market and the customs union. That isn't what people voted for. It isn't what was put in the manifestos for the election last year. And I'm glad to say it isn't government policy. So I think that they are expecting something to be happening that is not happening. Right. I mean, you've also said reneging on Brexit would be like Suez, a national humiliation based on lies. Do you really mean that? Oh, I very much mean that. I think the nation has spoken. It has decided that it wants to have its own independent future. And this has been a great democratic event for us, and a very uh, exciting one that we have shown that we are willing to go our own way. If this were undermined by subterfuge, by people saying they don't really want to reverse it when in fact they do, then that would indeed be a national humiliation. Uh, the United Kingdom is not Denmark or Ireland who, when they voted against the European Union, were told to vote again until they gave the right answer. Just to be treated in that way would be denying the greatness and the standing of our country. Right. I mean, Chris Patton, you may have heard, said your views as an eight-year-old were eccentric and they still are and they haven't changed as a 48-year-old. What do you say to that? Well, I don't remember discussing uh, the European Union uh, with Lord Patton when I was eight, though I have indeed known him a long time. What, what, what I would say to his lordship um, is that when he was governor of Hong Kong, I greatly supported him in trying to bring democracy to Hong Kong. It is a great sadness that he doesn't want democracy in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, he thinks he and his fellow Panjandrams know best and that we should have done what we were told in the referendum. Right. I agree with him that democracy is a good thing. He thought it was right in Hong Kong, and I think it's right in the United Kingdom. Right. But, I mean, he says the reason that he is fighting the idea of coming out of the single market and the customs union is because all the talk of new trade deals has been vastly exaggerated. You will never be able to make up that amount of trade from the loss of the deal with the EU, which we now know we are going to lose some access because Theresa May um, has said it. He says the closest the government has come to a free trade deal is the checkout at Waitrose. Is that true? No, it's not true at all. And I must confess, I thought his tone was rather condescending when he said that um, he knew so much more than the current Secretary of State for International Trade. Uh, Liam Fox has been concentrating on this, travelling the world, discussing this with our friends and allies uh, since he was appointed, and discovers that there is a great openness to trade deals, and these can be done very quickly. The deal between Australia and the United States uh, was done in under a year and led to a very significant increase in trade between Australia and the United States. Right. So not only can these deals be done quickly if there's a will, but they also lead to considerable expansions in trade. So there's great opportunity there. Right, but I mean, even according to the famous leaked civil service analysis, which is now in the public domain, Brexit will hit growth by up to 8% over the next 15 years and a free trade deal with America would only add 0.2% to growth over the same period, which backs up what, what Chris Patton has been saying. So the sums don't add up. And what makes you think you know more about economics no, no. than both the civil service and the IFS? Oh, well, I'm very happy to say that um, most people know more than the Treasury, which got it so catastrophically wrong before the referendum. The Treasury said there would be up to 800,000 job losses purely on a vote to leave. This was nonsense. This was Project Fear. And the Treasury, having been humiliated by the errors of its pre-Brexit vote forecasts, has then made even worse forecasts subsequently. And in that paper, it did not even consider, it did not evaluate, it made no estimates for the government's preferred option uh, by way of uh, the deal that we would have. So it was a worthless paper. And there are many better economists and professional economists, not like me, I, I accept that I am not a professional economist, who believe that we will have very significant advantages if we embrace free trade. What do you say to Chris Patton's assertion, um, which is actually factually correct in the sense that there is no technological solution to the border issue in Ireland that currently exists? 
Well, there's a border in Ireland already that there are different rates of VAT, there are different rates of Sure, but when we come out of the EU, where, where else in the world, alcohol. Jacob Rees-Mogg, oh, is, there, on, is there a technological solution? Like, like Magnus Magnuson, I've started so I'll finish. <laughs> there is already a border, but it is a soft border, and it is perfectly possible to have a border that is implemented remotely. When people talk about a hard border, what they mean are people in peaked caps and barriers going up and down. You do not need those. You can have tariffs, if there are any, paid in the same way as VAT. You can have inspections uh, for health reasons of food going back and forth at the site of production on behalf uh, of the country that they are going to. All of this is perfectly feasible. So the question is, do you need people in peak caps and infrastructure at the border, to which the answer is no. Will there be a change? Yes, of course there will, and everybody accepts that. Right. Where else does that exist in the world? Where else does what exist in the world? Having a technological solution so that you can have an invisible border without the men and women in peak caps. Well, this, just because something isn't there currently doesn't mean it's impossible to do. And in fact, it's really easy. But if you've got historic border structures, you have to remember that the tendency is to leave them there. So it's a, a new structure, but it's a very easily de deliverable one. And if you want an example where there's no border at all, there's one between the EU and the Vatican. But as the Vatican is not huge, uh, I don't think that necessarily counts. Not huge, that is an understatement there. Um, I mean, Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, Chris Patton it's very, echoed... It's very important <laughs> in, Well, in but we were ways, talking about size huge. there. Um, Chris Patton echoed John Major in saying there should be a free vote in Parliament. Would you support that? Um, uh, <laughs> Did uh, Lord Patton support free votes when he was chairman of the Conservative Party? Uh, Conservatives stood on a manifesto saying that they would implement the referendum and that we would leave the single market and the customs union. If you have said to your voters that that is what you will do, in honour you owe it to them to deliver on that. If any MP at the last election said that they disagreed with that and put out a private election address, uh, then that's a different matter. But the overall Conservative manifesto was absolutely clear, and those of us who were elected as Conservatives must stick to what we have promised to the electorate. To behave otherwise uh, would be improper. Jacob Rees-Mogg, thank you very much. Um, listening to both of those, there is a fundamental division at the heart of the Conservative Party over how to deal with Brexit. Who do you think will win that battle in the end? Will it be Jacob Rees-Mogg and the people who agree with him, or will it be Chris Patton? You might think this is a sort of cop-out answer and you might no, think it's... No. Not, politicians have never done that. But actually, I think the Prime Minister will win this argument. And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, she delivered the uh, first Brexit deal, the divorce. I have already said I think that she and the negotiating team will deliver the second element. And the first priority there is, of course, the free trade deal with the EU to try to maintain the advantages that we currently have. And actually, we've already talked about uh, the fact that will then have to be an independent immigration uh, policy as well. And I think that could almost be described as the third chapter. And I do believe that we are working through that chapter by chapter. Now, you might say that's optimistic, but I think the evidence so far would lead you to believe that that's so. And you asked me earlier a question, what I thought people in the West Midlands thought and uh, said. My feeling about what's said to me on the ground is they do agree with what... Uh, Jacob just said in that the Conservative Party stood on a manifesto to make uh, a success of leaving and they want to see that happening. But they also understand in business that we do need those deals to maintain the advantage we already have a free trade within the EU. All right. I think that was a bridge between the two sides. But maybe, well... that's, maybe, <laughs> that's, maybe that's the practical answer that's going to come through. And that's right. where I am. I've been getting away with it all.